So far, in solving linear congruences and using the Chinese remainder theorem, we've had bases of the equivalences that were all co-prime to one another, each uh, pairwise relatively prime. What happens if you have equivalences where the bases are not relatively prime? So we want to solve a system of linear congruences in one variable, but the bases might not be pairwise relatively prime anymore. It's tempting to just say, well, then no solutions, but that's not necessarily true. Can you find an x equivalent to 1 mod 10 and also equivalent to 1 mod 12? Well, the bases 10 and 12 are definitely not relatively prime, but 1 is definitely an integer that solves both. So there might be solutions even if the bases aren't relatively prime. And then an objection that I would get frequently in class at this point is, well, sure, I just had a 1 on both sides, so of course there's solutions. But what about this? x equivalent to 5 mod 10 and x equivalent to 7 mod 12 is also got solutions. For example, 55 is a solution. So just having the same number on the right-hand side isn't really the issue. Okay, I was able to find integers equivalent to 5 mod 10 and 7 mod 12, even though 10 and 12 are not relatively prime, and even though 5 and 7 weren't just the same number. And then some might say, well, maybe solutions always exist. However, this system, x equivalent to 1 mod 2 and equivalent to 0 mod 4, can't possibly have any solutions. The first is x is odd. Equivalent to 1 mod 2 means a multiple of 2 plus 1, an odd number. The second equivalence, however, says divisible by 4. And if you're divisible by 4, you're definitely divisible by 2. So you're even. And a number cannot be both even and odd. So this uh, system can't possibly have any uh, solutions. So how can we determine which systems do versus which systems do not have solutions at all? The pair of congruences, x equivalent to b1 mod n1 and equivalent to b2 mod n2, has solutions if and only if the target values b1 and b2 are equivalent modulo the greatest common divisor of the two bases. In this case, there is exactly one solution modulo the least common multiple of the two bases. If the two bases are relatively prime, this is a result we already know. If the two bases are relatively prime, this is asking for something modulo 1. In other words, is 1 a factor of b1 minus b2? Well, yes it is. 1 is a factor of everything. So b1 is always equivalent to b2 modulo 1. So if these two numbers are relatively prime, there are always solutions. And then, in fact, there is exactly one solution modulo the least common multiple. But if the two numbers were relatively prime, the least common multiple is simply the product n1, n2. So this is the result we already know if the two bases are relatively prime. Let's actually go ahead and prove this, however. Suppose there is a solution. So x is equivalent to b1 mod n1, but it's also equivalent to b2 mod n2. So it is a multiple of n1 plus b1, but it is also equal to a multiple of n2 plus b2. So I can set these two things equal to each other and get the following. k2n2 minus k1n1 is equal to b1 minus b2. So now what we have is a linear combination of the two bases, n1 and n2, with a result of this difference, b1 minus b2. Therefore, the greatest common factor of n1 and n2 must be a factor of that difference. Okay. <clears throat> this is Bezu's identity. Linear combinations of two numbers form multiples of the greatest common factor. So here we have a linear combination of n1 and n2. Therefore, this is a multiple of the greatest common factor, and that's what we have written right here. But if n1 and n2's greatest common factor is a factor of the difference b1 minus b2, that's the very definition that the two numbers are equivalent modulo that base. So if there are solutions, then this must be true. Now what we need to prove is that if this is true, then we can find a solution. So we've shown that this pair of equivalences can only have solutions if the two target values are equivalent modulo the greatest common divisor of the two bases. Now we have to go the other way. Assume that the two target values are equivalent, modulo the greatest common divisor of the bases, and then show that there is a solution. And once we've done that, show that all solutions must be equivalent, modulo the LCM.
Let's actually take care of that last part now. Suppose I have two different solutions. So both x and x prime are equivalent to b1 mod n1. Therefore, they're equivalent to each other, modulo n1. But they're also going to be equivalent to each other, modulo n2. And we have this old result that if two things are equivalent modulo two different bases, they must be equivalent modulo the least common multiple. So if x and x prime both solve both equivalences, they must be equivalent modulo the LCM of n1 and n2. So that takes care of that last bit. The only thing remaining in this theorem then is assuming b1 and b2 are equivalent modulo this GCD, can we find a solution x to both? Well, we can finally finish up this proof. The only thing we have left to do is assuming b1 and b2 are equivalent modulo that greatest common divisor, show that the system has solutions. So for convenience, let's let that greatest common divisor be written as d. So we get to assume that b1 and b2 are equivalent modulo d. Now d was the greatest common divisor of n1 and n2, so we can write n1 is d times something and n2 is d times something. And since this common factor d is in fact the largest thing that can be factored out of both, the numbers that are left behind, j and k, must be relatively prime to one another. Also, since b1 is equivalent to b2 modulo d, then b1 is equal to a multiple of d plus b2. So suppose x is a solution to our system of equivalences. It must satisfy that x is equivalent to b1 mod n1, in other words, x is a multiple of n1 plus b1, but also x is equivalent to b2 mod n2, so it's a multiple of n2 plus b2. If these two things are both equal to x, they must be equal to each other. n1 t1 plus b1 is equal to n2 t2 plus b2. And now what we're going to do is we're going to substitute this for n1, this for n2, and this for b1. So here we have n1 t1 plus b1 equals n2 t2 plus b2. We can cancel the b2 off of both sides here. Great. Now every term has a common factor of d, which is not zero, so I can divide it, cancel it out, get jt1 minus kt2 equals negative i once I move some things around. This has solutions if and only if this target value of negative i is in fact a multiple of the GCD of j and k. That's just Bezu's identity again. Here I have a linear combination of j and k, therefore this should be a multiple of uh, the greatest common divisor and vice versa. Since the greatest common divisor was one, this is definitely a multiple of one. So since this here has solutions t1 and t2, I can take the t1 and t2 that solve this and come all the way back here and solve my original. So assuming <clears throat> that b1 was equivalent to b2 modulo n1 n2's greatest common divisor, we were able to deduce there must be a solution. And we've already shown there can be only one solution modulo the LCM of n1 and n2. So we finally finished this proof. Two linear equivalences have solutions, a mutual solution x, if and only if the difference of the two target values is a multiple of the greatest common factor of the two bases. Now, on the previous slide, we finished this lengthy proof that solutions can exist under certain circumstances, but it's actually not a terribly convenient way to find solutions in general. So if we want to solve this pair of equivalences, and we assume that the greatest common divisor of the two bases is a factor of that difference, b1 minus b2, let's keep all the notation from the proof we just finished. So d is the greatest common divisor of n1 and n2, n1 is dj, n2 is dk, j and k must be relatively prime, since b1 was equivalent to b2 mod n2, we can write b1 is equal to something plus b2. What we needed to do is having solved for j, k, and i, now we need to solve for t1 and t2. If you can solve for t1 and t2, you can come back to what x was taken to be equal to and plug in t1 or t2 into either of these two things, you should get the same number either way. But solving this line right here requires using the extended Euclidean algorithm first to solve 
Since j and k are relatively prime, find integers z1 and z2 so that this combination produces a 1. Then multiply everything by negative i and isolate what uh, this integer and this integer are. And the extended Euclidean algorithm, while very fast for computers to do, can be a little lengthy if you're working by hand. If we're solving systems by hand and the bases are not extremely large, Specifically, we can perform addition of elements modulo the bases in our head pretty quickly. There is a faster method if you're just brute forcing it on paper because of an exam setting or something. So we're going to do brute force, but we're going to be marginally clever about it. We're asked to solve this pair of equivalences. First, we check that this is true, because if this isn't true, there are no solutions anyway. So suppose this condition is met. Solutions exist, but how do we find them if we have to do it by hand? If we can perform addition modulo one of the bases, I'm just going to use modulo n2, then we can solve the problem by brute force fairly quickly. We simply compute, we need the answer to be b1 mod n1. So b1 is one such number, or b1 plus n1, or plus 2n1, or plus 3n1, and so forth. So now I have a bunch of numbers that are all equivalent to b1 mod n1. If I simply take all of these and check what they're equal to, uh, sorry, equivalent to, modulo n2, eventually I'll find something that is equivalent to the desired value mod n2. So we simply keep checking b1 plus multiples of n1 modulo n2 until we find the desired value, because all of these are definitely equivalent to b1 mod n1. So once I find a multiple of n1 to add here so that this is equivalent to b2 mod n2, then we would be done. Let's try to do an example of this technique. Find an integer x that solves, equivalent to 8 mod 12, but also equivalent to 11 mod 15. So let's go ahead and solve it. We check, what's the greatest common factor of 12 and 15? It's 3. 8 minus 11 would be negative 3, so 8 and 11 are equivalent modulo that GCD. So solutions do exist to find. So we're going to solve by brute force, but we're not just going to guess and check. I'm not just going to say uh, 28 or 42, uh, 17. We're not just going to randomly throw numbers out there. We simply keep computing 8 plus larger and larger multiples of 12. They will all be equivalent to 8 mod 12. And all we do is we check one at a time until we are equivalent to 11 modulo 15. So 8 with no additional 12s added on is equivalent to 8 mod 15, not 11. If I add 12 to both sides, I would get 20, but 20 modulo 15 is equivalent to 5. If I add 12 again, I would get 17, but 17 is equivalent to 2. If I add 12 again, I get 14. If I add 12 again, I finally get 11. So starting with 8, which is definitely equivalent to 8 mod 12, and adding 12, which doesn't change the fact that all of these numbers are now equivalent to 8 mod 12, I just kept checking what are they mod 15 until we got the desired value of 11. So 56 is a solution to this problem. As long as you're dealing with fairly small bases, this is a pretty viable technique. Um, if you had extremely large bases, then you would really be relying on computer assistance to solve these in a reasonable amount of time. But if your unreasonable and terribly cruel professor is asking you to do some of these by hands and listing out all of the steps, then hopefully you're working with pretty small numbers, and this is really all the work that's required.